Good afternoon, good morning, hello everyone, and welcome to our live epigenetics focused webinar titled Performing CHIP Using Low Amounts of Frozen Mouse Brain Tissue, an investigation of how stress alters 5-HMC by mediating transcription factor binding, presented by C.C. Lee from the University of Wisconsin. Today's webinar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Covaris. My name is Sean Guerin. I am the epigenomics product manager at Covaris and also today's moderator. Joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Hermie Koja, principal scientist, who will, be, who will be available to answer your questions at the end alongside with Cece. Hamid has extensive experience in the field of epigenetics and is always willing to help our customers. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. Please feel free to submit as many questions as you would like at any time during the presentation. To ask a question, simply click into Ask a Question box, type your question, and click Send. All questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation during our dedicated Q&A session. You may also submit questions during the on-demand period and your questions will be answered via email. Just to note, to enlarge the slides, simply click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the slide window. If you are having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation at any time today, please click on the support tab found on the top right corner of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the answer a question box located on the far left corner of your screen. Now we've taken care of all the administrative things, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Cece Lee. Cece Lee finished the neuroscience PhD training program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she completed her graduate research in the lab of Dr. Reed Alish. Her research focused on the role of the environmentally sensitive novel epigenetic mark 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in response to stress Leading, leading to neuros, neuropsychiatric disorders. Cece has produced three co-first author publications, has released seven publications over her research career, and has given numerous oral and poster presentations at conferences across the country. Her final dissertation work was focused on developing a deeper understanding of the molecular mechanisms linking stress, 5-HMC, and transcription factor binding using chromatin immunoprecipitation. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to extend the warmest congratulations to Cece on behalf of everyone at Covaris for successfully completing her oral thesis defense last month. It's a fantastic accomplishment, and we're very happy and excited for her as she continues to progress in her career as a scientist. Without further ado, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Cece to begin the presentation. Thank you, Sean, for that very kind introduction, and I am um, Cece, the presenter, and I'm very excited to talk to everyone today about my dissertation research, which is on an investigation of how stress alters transcription factor binding by mediating 5-HMC. So stress can cause psychiatric disorders, and some risk factors are environmental factors, stressors such as childhood trauma, um, maternal separation, malnutrition, um, another big, uh, big factor is genetic. There are, these, there are these really important genes in the stress response, and when these genes are disrupted in their gene expression or protein function, um, these can lead to uh, psychiatric disorders, such as anxiety, depression, PTSD. Now, one in five adults in America experience a mental illness, so this is a huge problem, um, and it's not just in America, but all over the world. But one way that these um, environmental stressors can disrupt the functions of genes is through epigenetics. Now, what is epigenetics? Um, I define epigenetics as the modification that are epi, so on top of the genome, that may cause functional alterations to gene expression and DNA structure without changing the nucleotides themselves. And so here we have a chromosome, and when you zoom in, you see that there are DNA wrapped around these uh, proteins called histones, and they have tails um, that can be post-transcriptionally modified. So this is a domain called histomodification. Um, another domain of epigenetics uh, is when you zoom in even further to the nucleotide level, there are these methyl groups that can um, attach onto cytosines, and those are um, the most the two most common the study methyl um, groups are 5-MC and 5-HMC. And so 
MC5 methylcytosine. Um, it's just as simple as a methyl group attached to cytosine. But in 2009, it was rediscovered that uh, these family of enzymes called TET family enzymes can that are very environmentally sensitive can actually convert 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, which is the mark that um, my thesis is based on. And so these marks can actually affect transcription. Um, so here is a protein a transcription factor, which is a protein that uh, recognizes a specific sequence on DNA um, called the binding site for this, um, and different transcription factors have different um, binding sequences that they bind to. And so this protein can recognize a sequence um, and bind to it and cause transcription and then later on translation. Um, and 5-MC and 5-HMC can modify the binding of the transcription factors and therefore uh, modify transcription. And so 5-HMC and 5-MC, um, there's a lot of differences between them. And here's an example in human embryonic stem cells. So uh, on the left, we have an immunohistochemistry staining of 5 HMC, um, so this is chromatin, and then um, the second panel is 5-MC uh, in red. And when you merge the two images um, on the last image, uh, you can actually see that the distribution of 5-HMC and 5-MC are very different. So 5-HMC is mostly on the arms of the chromosome where gene expression, uh, gene coding are, and 5-HMC is mostly packed in the middle where um, it's, it's near the paracentric uh, region where the DNA is very densely packed. And so other, other features of 5-HMC that makes it a, a marker, a very important marker, is that it's actually tenfold more enriched in the central nervous system uh, compared to the peripheral tissue um, of the body. And make, so therefore making it a really um, promising marker to study brain-related disorders. It's also been actively uh, associated with transcription in the brain. Um, it's a sense of reemergence in research in 2009. It's already been involved um, in neurodevelopmental and as well as neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and the family of enzymes, the TET family enzymes that convert 5-MC um, into 5-HMC are actually extremely environmentally sensitive. And so a visual example of this uh, here is, um, so this is um, a literal mice um, that are, it's the same, these six mice are from the same litter. And when they were born, they were all this golden color. Um, and as you add vitamin B12, also known as folic acid, and it's a, a methyl donor, um, just in their drinking water, so just in their diet. Um, so the methyl donor is an important part of DNA methylation. You can, as you increase the amount of vitamin B12 added to their diet, uh, their coat color actually changes um, and gets darker and darker. Um, and so um, this is an example, a visual example of how 5 can see um, or how uh, an environmental factor such as diet can actually change, um, change in a very visible way um, throughout a lifetime of mouth. And so in my research, we decided um, to study how stress affects salvation C and may lead to psychiatric disorders. Um, we chose a very established uh, stress paradigm. And in our stress group, we have a 30-minute restraint control um, and then an hour of recovery period and then the amount of sacrifice. And we investigate how stress can disrupt 5-HMC uh, compared to the control group. And so we can't talk about stress without talking about the HPA axis and how that regulates stress. Uh, so the um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis um, is initiated when a external stressor is detected by an organism, and that causes the activation of uh, the, uh, the hypothalamus to activate the pituitary, to activate the adrenal, to secrete cortisol. And cortisol can actually um, go back and bind to glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus, which is a region that I study. And, and the binding of this cortisol to the receptors initiates a negative feedback 
mechanism, therefore, um, therefore uh, dampening or stopping the activation of HP axis. Um, however, when you have in the blue where there are less glucocorticoid receptors, in particular in the hippocampal, um, in the hippocampus and brain, um, you're going to have less negative feedback, therefore a prolonged activation of the HPA axis, which can lead to um, detrimental effects later on. And the glucocorticoid gene is um, called NR3C1. And when we looked at um, the 5-HMC and how uh, stress affects 5-HMC on this particular gene, we found that acute stress actually causes about a two-fold increase in 5-HMC in this very important gene, um, the group of corticoid receptor gene, NR3C1. And so that led us to think that um, perhaps there are, since there are many genes involved in the stress pathway, there must be um, other genes that are affected by uh, stress, and we want to know how stress affects um, these different genes across the whole genome. So we used a selective labeling, purification, and genomic location mapping uh, uh, of 5 HMC technique to see where 5 HMC is located in control animals compared to animals that have been stressed. And so this is actually pretty similar to CHIP. I'm just going to go over it very quickly. So we have genomic DNA, and then we segment it into um, 300 base pairs, and the red lines are the ones that contain 5 HMC. Uh, so there's an arrangement of it. And then um, a glucose moiety is tacked onto the 5 HMC, and biotin um, is glucose moiety, and then we can use affinity purification to uh, pull out only the fragments that are enriched in 5 HMC. Um, and sequence this across the whole genome and figure out where 5 HMC is in the control animals compared to the restraint animals. Um, so what we're interested in are regions with increased or decreased 5 HMC in response to an acute stress. So for example, here, um, this is a uh, snapshot of, a, um, of the UCSC genome browser. And on top, we have control, our three control animals, and then on the bottom, our restraint animals. So this region um, that's, uh, that's um, boxed in red would be a region with, with increased 5 HMC due to stress, um, due to restraint stress. Um, and this region that just popped up would be a decrease um, of 5 HMC um, in response to stress. And so when we looked at all of the regions, um, across the whole genome, um, which we can see here in this Manhattan plot, uh, where the, um, the x-axis are the chromosomes, and the y-axis just tells you how, um, how uh, different the changes, is, changes are from control. And so um, you can, first you can see that um, every point on this graph is a place where there is 5-HMC detected. And so um, across HMC is present across the whole genome, and anything above the red line or below the, the red dash line and below the green uh, dash line uh, are a significant region with increase or decreased HMC. And you can see that even with an acute stress of 30 minutes, uh, 5 HMC is changing significantly across the whole genome. And um, when we looked at these, um, when we looked at these regions and the actual nucleotides uh, in sequences in this region, we found that um, there are transcription factor binding sites in these regions with 5 HMC disruption. And so these transcription factor binding sites are commonly called motifs, and we divided them into uh, motifs in regions with an increased 5 HMC and motifs in regions with decreased 5 HMC. And so here, um, are the uh, are some of the potential um, uh, binding sites, and and we also found that these binding sites are predicted to bind to transcription factors um, that are um, already related to stress. So we want to know if an acute stress can actually cause a a change um, in transcription factor binding, um, and so we have to select the the top transcription factor um, to test this question out. And so we had many different criteria 
for selecting a transcription factor, such as, uh, first of all, is it expressed in the brain? Um, is it expressed in the hippocampus? Is it important for development of neuron? Is it associated with uh, psychiatric disorder authority? Um, so the one that we picked is SMAT3. And so you can see SMAT3's um, consensus binding site next to it. Um, and it has a really nice consensus binding site of eight base pairs. Uh, making it, um, giving it a greater chance that we would um, find uh, SMAT3 um, specific binding to this. And we also needed to pick a gene to test this out with. And so um, from all the genes that are disrupted um, due to an acute stress, we um, also conducted RNA. What we're interested in is also gene expression changes um, and not just 5-HMC changes. Um, and we did RNA sequencing using the same, um, from the same tissue and the same, same animal, same tissue. And we found the set of differential expressed genes. And we overlapped that with the set of differential 5-HMC. And we found 11 genes that contain changes in both 5-HMC and gene expression due to an acute stress. And so here are the gene diagrams of these 11 genes that contain changes in both, um, separated by upregulated gene expression and downregulated gene expression. And when you, when we, uh, when I looked at uh, these genes and um, all of them and just what functions they had, I actually found that six of these genes have um, been associated with stress already. And when I looked at the um, the sequences, the DNA sequences in the binding um, in the regions that are differentially hydroxymethylated in these um, 11 genes, I found that all 11 of these genes actually had significant in, um, significantly enriched transcription factor binding sites. And so, um, however, um, what 9 a um, had a transcription factor binding site um, of SMAT3, which is the transcription factor that we had chosen. And so, um, so 19A and SMAT3 were chosen together um, to give me the best chance to um, answer this question, does stress affect transcription factor binding? And so here you can see that um, but 19A contains a SMAT3 binding site, um, and which is highlighted in yellow. And all of the CG sites um, that are highlighted in green around it are, um, are sites on the nucleotide where there could be 5-HMC um, difference changes. And so naturally the question is, does stress alter transfer factor? And may and this alteration may be mediated by 5-HMC since there are so many binding sites near it. Um, and the method we chose to investigate this question was um, using chromatin, chromatin immunoprecipitation, so CHIP. And so um, here's just a little overview of CHIP. Uh, first, you want to cross-link to transcription factors um, in, um, to the genomic DNA. And so, for example, SMAT3 might be down to a DNA. Um, and then we uh, want to cross-link those so they're together, chop it up into about 300 base pairs. Um, and some of these, um, some of these uh, DNA segments will be bound by SMAP3. And then we used a antibody that's specifically tagged onto SMAP3 to pull out only regions that are bound by SMAP3. And then eluded the DNA and did, um, so I did QTCR, but you could also do sequencing, genome-wide sequencing with this. And so the covariance protocol focuses um, its, tissue, um, its tissue workflow. Uh, is the first you have harvest your tissue, in my case it's the hippocampus, and then we section the tissue, fix the tissue. Um, we can use, uh, since it's tissue, um, we can pulverize it, and then prepare the nuclei, shear the chromatin, um, and then analyze the shear to see um, if it's um, good quality DNA. And so the tissue, um, tissue sample workflow, there are a couple of very important steps um, that uh, needs um, that should be focused on. Um, and first is the uh, the fixation with formaldehyde. Um, second is the cryofaction tissue with the cryopep. Um, and then there's 
the, uh, I, the nuclear isolation process. And lastly, it's the chromatin sharing. And, um, and these steps all uh, may need to be optimized depending on what tissue um, you are um, planning on using. And so with tissue preparation, um, here are some tips for um, tip with low amounts of frozen brain tissue. Um, brain tissue is a very difficult tissue to work with. Um, and so what I do is I use um, intracardiac perfusion to wash away the blood um, using very ice cold PBS. And so here you can see a picture of a fresh brain um, versus a brain perfused uh, with PBS to wash away the blood. So the, there's a very big difference there. And timing is also uh, key. So you want to do this as fast um, and as cold as possible to preserve the biomolecules. Um, so then I take out the hippocampus and then I flash freeze it. Um, and another tip is that you want to ensure that um, the buffers that are um, that may precipitate are um, are after they're heated and the precipitants are dissolved. Um, you want to make sure that they're at room temperature before you add it to any of your tissue. And so um, the critical steps of um, cutting tissue uh, and uh, tissue samples and very in small amounts um, is, uh, so I'm planning on publishing a, um, a methods paper based on this. So this is all the tools that I use to um, get uh, from, so I use hippocampal tissue, which is about 30 to 40 milligrams in an adult male of um, black six mice. Um, and so I can get about from uh, 30 to 40 milligrams of tissue, about three to four milligrams of protein from that amount of mouse brain tissue. Um, so that's, that's actually a lot. Um, and another critical step is um, tissue pulverization. So, um, so this is the part where um, uh, you use the pulverizer and, um, and this is, uh, um, uh, so you wanna make sure again that the tissue is kept very cold and sometimes there could be pancake-like formations, um, such as seen in the picture um, on the right. And so what I do is just, I use my index finger and my thumb to quickly squeeze it, like, and then you can feel if there's any, um, any non-powder uh, substance. And if there is, then just, um, just uh, repeat the process in the protocol until it's powder-like. And, um, and then again, um, keep it as cold as possible. So dip it back into um, liquid nitrogen about every 10 seconds if you think it's uh, going to start to thaw. And I also, um, um, and to get most of the, tish, uh, the tissue, I transfer it directly to um, a, a centrifuge tube. And so the critical steps of CHIP is um, performing fixation, cell lysis, and chromatin shearing. And so for the fixation, um, this is a very, very important step. Um, you want to use methanol-free formaldehyde. Um, so I make the 16, um, I make the 1% formaldehyde uh, from the 16% uh, methanol-free formaldehyde. Um, and then I actually make that right before I add it to the tissue. Um, and um, just to make sure um, that you're getting all the tissue and, and the least amount of tissue loss. Um, if you're seeing that they're after centrifugation, that there's tissue loss, you can always increase it, um, increase the centrifuge uh, speed by about 20%. And you do not want to use um, the commonly sold 30% um, formaldehyde uh, that has about 15% methanol. And so the importance of uh, formaldehyde that is, uh, uh, that is free of methanol can be seen here. So in figure one, it's fresh formaldehyde fixed at room temperature. And I think these are, um, these are cells. And, um, and if you spike that fresh uh, methanol with 1.5%, uh, that fresh formaldehyde with 1.5% methanol, you can see that it's already over fixed. And over fixation can also increase your cause over cross-linking, which can increase your IgG background, which is commonly used as a um, background negative control, so a mock IP. Um, and so um, my tips for investigating low amounts of brain tissue 
Um, so why is brain tissue so hard to work with? As you can see on the chart on the left, so this is processed all the same way, but using liver tissue, muscle tissue, and brain tissue, and you get the lowest yield from brain tissue. So first, uh, most people who are working with animal brain tissue are working with mice or um, or rat brain tissue, and so you just have very low tissue quantity to start with. And um, the weight of these tissue uh, may vary by strain, um, by a lot, actually. Uh, brain tissue is soft. Um, cell counts vary in different tissue types, depending on what region of the brain you're interested in. And the amount of the transcription factor or histone marker um, that you are investigating um, is also extremely important. Um, for example, um, you, it's, it's a really good idea to actually, it's, it's, um, it's great to do an epitope integrity test. Um, so what we did was we, um, because overfixation can cause overcrosslinking and block, uh, and block the epitopes that your antibody is trying to tag onto. So what um, I did was I had five different time points of fixation, so from five minutes to 20 minutes. Um, and I used the Western blot um, using the same antibody um, to, uh, to check that my epitopes are still intact. And, um, and brain tissue is also hard because the neurons are surrounded by myelin, this fat layer that disrupts fixation and um, also sonication, making it harder to, um, to work with. And even cutting, uh, so cutting brain tissue into, into um, similar chunk sizes um, very fast for cells is almost impossible. And these neuronal proteins are also sensitive to temperature changes. And so um, the major difference between working with cultured cells and small masses of tissue is that in cultured cells, you have a single layer of um, cells that is grown. And so the fixation is very even versus using a razor blade. Um, and in my case, it's cutting the hippocampus to equal size pieces. Um, and you can see that um, below the hippocampal uh, picture is the brain. And so the, this, is, this is a full adult mouse brain, and it's, it's very small to begin with. Um, and I'm lucky to be working with the hippocampus because it's actually, um, it's, it's, you, can straight, you can dissect it out straight from a fresh brain, um, like such as the picture demonstrates from one to seven. Um, so you're working with a tiny amount of uh, tissue here. And also within the hippocampus, there are many different kinds of cell types. And so um, you've got, and also myelin, because there's a lot of connections as well. And so that makes working with tissue much harder than working with cell culture. And um, some critical steps uh, that I optimize for the nuclei proliferation is that I, um, instead of using two 200 microliter um, lysis buffer, I just rinse the, um, the bag that was 400 microliters of buffer. Um, and I also dilute the, um, the 130 microliter of lysate after sonication with the IP buffer. And I spin it down for 10 minutes at uh, max speed at 4C. And so that's going to precipitate all of the debris um, and give you a much cleaner lysate sample to work with. So you want to just transfer that into a new tube, and you, have, you will have a much cleaner chip. Um, so here are some data that, um, from my own um, practice samples. Uh, so these are practice samples 1 to 3. And then you can and the settings on the covariance uh, so I used S220, um, and the settings are seen on the lower right corner, and so this is a very reproducible result. And when you zoom in on the sample number one, uh, this is what I got when I, um, when I diluted um, my 16% uh, methanol free formaldehyde ample, um, and then uh, created a 1% formaldehyde solution and fixed it for eight minutes. And so um, coming back to my project, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, this is um, that we are interested in how stress affects transcription factor binding uh, of SMAP3 to the 19A gene. And so here, um, looking, here is the chip qPCR that I did. And this is um, data from, um, from my lab. 
And so um, on the right, we used adult hippocampal tissue. We rinsed the blood uh, intracardiacly. We used 1% muscle free ample and then flash froze. Um, the hippocampus fixed at uh, room temperature for just eight minutes and sonic hit it with the S220 um, for eight minutes as well. And what you can see here is that um, so the blue, um, so the blue bar and the gray bar come from the same animal, and it's um, the immunoprecipitated and the IgG background control. And then the red bar uh, is our acute restrained stress animal, and um, the white bar is the IgG control for that. And so first, you can see that the IgG controls are very low um, in this uh, in this graph meaning that um, there is not overfixation, and that there's a significant difference between, um, between my control IP and my control IgG, um, meaning, uh, however, what I want you to focus on is that there's a significant difference as well between the control and the restraint stress. So that means that an acute stress of 30 minutes is reducing the binding of SMAP3 to what 9 a significantly. Um, yeah, and so um, we wondered why is this happening? How can an acute stress reduce the binding of SMAP3 to what 9 a And so could it be that acute stress is affecting um, just SMAP3 to protein levels? And so we asked the question, is the decrease in SMAP3 binding to 19A caused by a decrease in SMAP3 levels? And so here um, I did a Western blot uh, with my controls and my restraints in duplicates. Um, and we found that um, total SMAD is does not actually change due to acute stress. So SMAD is a protein um, that is activated by phosphorylation, and it actually can't get into the nucleus. It can be translocated into the nucleus unless it's phosphorylated. And so the antibody that I used for CHIP does not distinguish between just inactive SMAD and active SMAD. However, um, when we looked at uh, phosphorylated SMAD at, um, at uh, tyrosine 179 position, um, we saw that there was a decrease in SMAD3 activation. So less phosphorylated SMAD means less activated SMAD, which means less SMAD in the nucleus to bind to 19A. Um, and that could be a mechanistic explanation of why an acute stress is causing SMAD3 to bind less to 19A from our chip data. And so further on, um, to tie all of this to, to 5 HMC, um, Naturally, we wanted to know, does 5-HMC disrupt SMAD binding to 19A? Uh, and for this, we used um, an electro, uh, electrophoretic mobility shift assay called an EMSA, where we created probes, um, wild-type probes, about 30 base pair containing um, of the 19A sequence containing the SMAD binding site, and then also a site that um, could, so that would, that was our wild type probe. And then we also created um, the same probe, but just with an additional modification uh, of 5 HMC. Um, and this is double strand DNA. And so these probes, um, these are only 30 uh, base pair probes and with the binding site and um, wild type uh, versus um, 1A. And we found that if you add 5 HMC to this probe, you get almost half decrease of binding um, of SMAP3 to, to the SMAP3 binding site. And so 5-HMC um, is most likely causing SMAT to be, um, to, to be bound less in the stress condition. And in addition to that, we also, um, we also made a mutant, um, a mutant binding site. So um, I, the SMAT binding site, uh, again, is eight different, um, is eight nucleotides. And um, I mutated the first four nucleotides. So at this uh, clear position that just showed up, um, that there's no bend there, meaning that um, it, the mutant label does not actually, the mutant um, probe does not bind SMAT3. Um, 
So with that, I came up with a working model of how mechanistically an acute stress could first disrupt five agency um, as well as transcription factor binding and how that um, could lead to gene expression changes um, from my own data. And so we, um, so in this working model, you can see that uh, on top is the plasma membrane and then uh, below that is the nuclear membrane. And then the segment, um, uh, we have control uh, 19A segment and then acute stress 19A segment. Um, and then uh, we know from my own data that 19A, in response to acute stress, um, there's an increase of vibration C. So the, so the red dot is um, an increase in vibration C in the acute stress um, section of this gene. And we also know that there is a smell of binding site in 19A, and that's indicated by the green rectangle. Um, so we know from the data, uh, both the chip qPCR data and the AMSA data that SMAP3, um, there's, a, there's a decrease of binding in SMAP3 in acute stress, which means that um, there's more binding of SMAP3 in the control, um, control animals to its binding site within 19A. Um, uh, we also know from the literature that MECP2, which is meso CPG binding protein 2, um, it's a protein that binds 5MC and 5HMC. Um, it functions to block uh, binding of transcription factors that um, are trying to bind to their um, transcription factor binding sites. Um, so in the acute stress case, uh, MECP2 could be binding to the 5HMC and blocking transcription factor from binding uh, like SNAP3 from binding to its site. And furthermore, from our RNA sequence data, we know that there's a decrease in gene expression and, um, and, and this gene expression, um, so, um, so if there's a decrease in um, gene expression, we're gonna have more gene expression um, in the control and so uh, indicated by the bigger um, um, in the control, and then also this will cause more gene expression. And lastly, with the Western blot data, uh, with acute stress causing a decrease of um, SMAD activation, uh, we can see that there will be more SMAD, um, activated SMAD in the control animals uh, within the nucleus since uh, non-phosphorylated SMAD and the phosphorylation is indicated by the yellow dots on the SMAD protein. Uh, Non-phosphorylated SMAD cannot uh, translocate into the nucleus. So giving control animals more of a chance to have, have more 19A gene expression compared to acute stress animals. Um, and so this is all from um, my own data. And so um, since I was curious how, uh, to how this could tie together, into, um, into psychiatric disorders, which is what I'm really interested in. Um, I, said, uh, I investigated the one pathway, so 19A um, is a member in this big family of one, uh, um, one members, and um, the one pathway uh, and, um, is connected to psychiatric disorders, um, such as a major depressive disorder. And so looking in my own data, and the regions that have changes in 5 HMC, I find that in the one um, that there are genes in the one pathway that are um, that have changes in 5 HMC, such as GSK3 beta, AGTs, um, and other members of the one family. And these genes are all already associated with stress-related psychiatric disorder. So to take this a step further, um, to take this a step further. I made a working model including um, the literature that I found, um, including this one pathway. And so when, if you have more gene expression, you will have um, most likely more uh, protein translation and, and 19A actually goes out of the plasma membrane, but it blocks GSK3 beta. And GSK3 beta um, blocks, in its natural case, blocks beta catenin and beta-catenin can translocate 
um, into the nucleus and cause transcription of uh, Wet9A. However, um, oh, and as well as AKT1 uh, and 2, um, uh, and these are all genes that are found in my own data that have changes in um, 5 HMC. AKT1 and 2 can also inhibit GSK3 beta. And so what I found in the literature is that um, GSK3 beta um, increase uh, and AKTs decreased in enzyme activity in post-mortem suicide victim brains um, with major depression, but not suicide victim brains without major depression. So, um, so what is happening with uh, in patients with major depression could be that there's an increase in GSK3 beta, which means that um, it's more active, it's, it's um, enzyme activity is higher, so it's blocking beta continin more, and blocking beta continin is gonna uh, it's gonna decrease the transcription of 19A, and also a um, a decrease in AKTs is going to decrease its block of beta of GSK3 beta. And that's going to even increase the activity of GSK3 uh, beta more, and that's going to block beta catenin more, and therefore um, beta catenin is going to have even less um, of a, uh, ability to, trans to help with transcription of 19A and perhaps facilitate SMAP3 binding. And so, in an extreme case, um, so my model is a mouse model of th a 30, just a 30-minute stress in a one-hour recovery period, and I'm already finding all these changes. But imagine in extreme cases in humans where, um, where there is uh, severe chronic stress um, uh, that are disrupting 5-HMC um, that may lead to a full-blown psychiatric disorder. So since 5-HMC is responding so fast, to um, even such a small, a short stressor. And so, um, so with that, I'd like to thank my, um, everyone in my lab, everyone who's helped me. I have been, um, uh, I've, as Sean introduced, I've collaborated with 13 different labs and I wanna thank everyone in all of those labs who have helped me throughout my dissertation uh, and my graduate school years. Uh, careers, I'd like to thank my thesis committee uh, and funding, and also everyone from Covaris, uh, who has been very generous in giving me this platform to um, speak out about my research. Um, I'd like to thank my program, and as well as um, my support system, which is very important. And um, so CHIP actually took me two years to, um, to, to do. And um, two years in five different labs and five different protocols. So you can imagine during the fourth protocol um, and a year and a half into it, I was pretty desperate and thinking it's never going to work. But when I saw the seminar that Dr. Hamid uh, Koja presented at UW Madison, um, I, it, that was the fifth protocol, the magical protocol that actually made everything work and work together and incorporating all this data um, and, and the rest just fell into place. So um, with that, I'd like to um, uh, conclude my portion and hand the presentation back to Sean. Cece, thank you so much for your highly informative presentation. Before we begin our interactive Q&A session with the audience, I'd like to take just a few minutes to review Covaris products that can be used for your specific applications. Covaris offers multiple chromatin sample preparation reagent kits to enable you to effectively prepare samples for chip-based applications. The TrueChip chromatin sharing kits have been fully validated for use on all Covaris Focus ultrasonicators to ensure reproducibility results when enriching for specific histone modifications and transcription factors of interest. The TrueChip reagent kits enable investigators to work with low cell and low tissue mass inputs, as we saw today, as well as high cell and high mass inputs. And as on the figure on the right, um, as you can see, an increasing number of peer-reviewed publications continue to cite Covaris due to the high quality results achieved from our optimized workflow. And just some key advantages to highlight of, you, of pairing TrueChip with the Covaris Adaptive Focus Acoustics technology include 
the ability to, the, one of the most critical things is to maintain the protein DNA interactions with an optimized fixation strategy in consumables. So importantly, uh, the, uh, the vessels that are, are made of glass, which minimizes heat buildup and allows the samples to be processed without disrupt, disrupting those protein DNA interactions. And this is an issue that's often encountered with the uh, plastic tubes due to the fact that they absorb heat and do not dissipate it as quickly. And it's critically important when working with low abundant epitopes or histone marks and rare transcription factors. Another key advantage is the ability to consistently shear chromatin to the correct size for sequencing. The distribution size is critical when performing, especially for chip seek and, and the, for, with high throughput sequencing. And the standardization of the sample preparation workflow for all mammalian sample types, allowing you to quickly establish the conditions for your cell line. And as a result, uh, you do not need to continuously re-optimize the fixation and shearing conditions on an ongoing basis. And briefly, I wanted to touch upon our standardized uh, tissue chip workflow, which CC covered very nicely in her presentation. We have validated this workflow in our true chip chromatin shearing tissue kit protocol. This workflow is very simple, quick, and easy. To start, you insert your tissue into the Covaris tissue bag. This bag is made of a polymer that can withstand extremely cold temperatures, allowing the tissue to be flash frozen in liquid nitrogen and pulverized dry to bypass any cross-contamination issues. And it, again, just looking at the workflow, um, the first step again is you have the bag and then to, you use the cryoprep in step two, as you can see, to homogenize the tissue. And then the contents of that material is moved to a transfer tube in step three. Uh, for lysis followed by chromatin shearing with uh, a, a covirus focus ultrasonicator. The shear chromatin, chromatin is then ready for IP with your antibodies. After IP, the crosslinks are reversed by treating the sample with heat and protein ESK to digest the proteins and any, any nucleases that may be present. The DNA is purified with a PCR purification kit and then now is ready for library prep. And again, just wanted to highlight the three main reagent kits that are available for use. Um, including our ultra-low chromatin shearing kit, which is optimized for processing less than 100,000 cells. Um, again, this is for cells cultured as a suspension or as inherent. And then our standard kit, our 520154, which processes 1 to 30 million cells per sample. And finally, our true chip tissue kit, which can be used to process low tissue masses of around 15 milligrams and all the way up to 120 milligrams. And the reagents uh, and this kit com the, the kit comes with all the reagents and buffers required to carry out the fixation, nuclei prep, and chromatin sharing steps of the workflow. And as you can see in parentheses, that gives you an indication of how many reactions you get depending on what volume you are actually shearing in. So you get up to 50 if you're doing between, for example, 1 to 50 reactions if you're doing between 1 and 3 million cells in, the, in our microtube 130. And um, the adaptive focus acoustics technology is Covaris's core technology. Our, Covar our focus ultrasonicators are extremely versatile, allowing the investigators to process multiple sample inputs for a variety of downstream applications. AFA standardizes your next generation sequencing sample prep workflow for a variety of sequencing applications, including whole genome, whole exome, and amplicon shearing. AFA is part of many commercially available library prep preparation workflows, including Illumina, Rubicon Genomics, Nugen, Swift, and Agilent Technologies. And in addition, AFA can be used to actively extract nucleic acids from FFPE tissues or plasma to isolate cell-free DNA using our True Extract products for translational and clinical sample preparation analysis. AFA can also be used to lyse cells and small tissues to extract biomarkers such as proteins for mass spec and immunoassays. In addition to that, RNA can also be shared using AFA for RNA-seq instead of using divalent cations and heat, uh, providing a much more simplified workflow. And we offer um, instruments for low throughput, such as our M220 on the left, which processes one sample per run, medium throughput, which processes our ME220, which processes up to eight samples per run, and then our high throughput workflow, uh, our high throughput, throughput instruments, such as the LE220 plus focus ultrasonicator, which processes up to 96 samples per run with eight samples processed simultaneously. And because our webinar is focused on epigenetics, I wanted to share with you other applications that can be performed using our products that may be of interest to you. In addition to the use for chip seek, chip qPCR, AFA can also be used to process samples for DNA methylation analysis using methylseq. And we are part of the Agilent protocol as an example, whole genome bisulfite sequencing and other chromatin applications such as HiC for chromatin architecture studies, CHIRP-seq, and RIP-seq. And depending on your laboratory's throughput and applications and sample types, your Covaris representative can help determine 
the most appropriate instrument for your laboratory. If you're interested in learning more, please visit our website at www.colvirus.com to find helpful resources on our products. You can find application notes, protocols, and other resources that will be helpful for, find, for information. If you'd like to reach your local sales manager, please email your regional customer service team listed here or contact me directly via email and phone and I'd be more than willing to assist you. You can also follow Covaris on social media platforms including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube where helpful resources are posted routinely. So without further ado, I, let's get started with the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Again, just as a reminder to ask a question, click on the answer a question box located on the far left corner of your screen. Type your question into the box and hit send. So let's get started. I'm already seeing some questions coming in, Cece, so I'm gonna start reading them to you and we'll get started. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. The first question is, what is the range of good concentration of shared chromatin when using mouse brain tissue? Um, so with DNA, um, you want to, there's a lot of factors that could, uh, could, mod, could change this range. So if you have about 25 to 50 like micrograms of DNA, that should be enough, but it also depends on like how much of the protein. So I mainly based my uh, chip uh, using protein concentration rather than DNA concentration, um, since I knew that my protein was uh, was very abundant in the region that I uh, I tested. Um, and so like I I used about 300 micrograms of protein, which is enough to do an IP. Um, and uh, but that also depends on if your um, like the tissue type and the quality of the antibody and um, and your epitope integrity. So um, like I can't I don't have an exact range, um, but you just you would want to maximize your um, chances with both your protein of interest and your DNA binding site. Does that make okay. sense? Yes, I think if the if the if, if, well yes. So if, if yeah, the because it's not is, about just the concentrate. There's just the amount of DNA, since um, all of right. these other factors could affect it. Yeah. And the next question is, um, what is the best way to get enough concentration of chromatin? And maybe you could speak on what you were doing previously and how it was difficult to get enough uh, chromatin with your previous method and speak to that a little bit as well and how that, that was affected yeah. by your previous method. Um, yes, that would be good. Right. So now, um, so now I'm getting about uh, three to four micrograms of, um, of protein from uh, 30 to 40 micrograms of uh, tissue. And before, I was only getting um, like... 200 nanograms of protein um, and I think one of the biggest uh, factors is keeping the tissue frozen and so I take the tissue out uh, now using the Colveris protocol I take the tissue out and um, I section my tissue in uh, with the help of uh, liquid nitrogen so it's frozen all the way through until it's fixed so once it's fixed it's safe um, um, from de degradation, but um, before I was using um, the um, the um, the plunger. Uh, what was that called? The, um, the down homogenizer. I was, yes, yep. the homogenizer, and so um, so it's like all of the like even if it's on ice, like you're exposing all of the cells to uh, to uh, to temperatures that could degrade the proteins. And so I think the main difference between this huge increase in DNA and protein that I'm getting is um, keeping the tissue as cold as possible uh, and basically completely frozen until it's fixed. Okay. The next question, actually, I can see the person's name now. So the next question comes from Claudia, and her question is, um, from the starting material of 30 to 40 milligrams, um, do you run one full experiment, including controls, 
and do you advise um, storing shared chromatin for further chip assays? Uh, yeah, so from one, um, from, oh, I can see this, yeah. Um, so from one mouse, I can get about uh, three to four mo uh, micrograms of protein, and that's enough to run uh, both the IP and the IgG. Um, I don't know as much about uh, about um, sequencing using that much, uh, which maybe Hami could comment later on, uh, but for, like, uh, for qPCR, it's it's plenty to, um, and you could do a couple of genes. I would say like four to five, depending again on the abundance of your um, your protein. Yeah. Okay. In the region. The next question comes from B. Young from Johns Hopkins, and he's asking, what volume did you use for IP? Was it 500 micrograms, one mil, or two mils? What volume base? Oh, um, so for IP, I used um, 300 microliters. Okay. Um, and just in a um, 1.5 uh, microliter tube. Um, but the key to that is that you want to make sure that it's agitated and very well agitated all throughout uh, overnight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Monica, and it is, what other genes were linked to SMAD3 in the chip RT-QPCR data? Um, so I tested out two. Um, so SMAD3 binds to many different genes. Uh, we picked 198 because it was um, the most compatible with within the 11. Um, but we also tested out some housekeeping genes, um, such as uh, GAPDH and H HPRT. And so um, these housekeeping genes, um, one of them we found actually a decrease as well with stress, um, and then a, um, in, and the other one we didn't find a decrease um, with SMAT3, but both of them um, are affected by the stress levels. Okay. The binding, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is another good question from Byung at Johns Hopkins, is he's asking, are the antibodies that you used for IP all chip grade, or did you use any, or did you, any of them that do not say chip grade also work? Maybe speak to um, how well characterized the antibody actually has to be, or for it to be for chip. So the antibody that I used for chip um, all throughout is the same antibody for my three experiments, my EMSA, Western blot, and uh, chip qPCR, and that was a chip grade antibody. Um, but when I did a, um, a super search essay with my EMSA, uh, um, EMSA experiment, um, it didn't actually work. So uh, for these experiments, um, it was, uh, that antibody worked perfectly fine. Okay. So I haven't tested out any uh, like non-chip grade antibody, but you can also, like what I do is I just call the company because sometimes they, um, they have information about uh, papers that other people have sent them using that antibody on different experiments that are not published yet. Okay. The next question is from Celia, um, and I'm going to direct it to Hamid. Do you have experience with paraffin-embedded tissue samples? And you can speak to that workflow that we do have, Hamid. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. Um, uh, we, uh, there's currently two publications out in which uh, they cite Kovars for chip from uh, FFP samples. We can certainly provide you those reference. But also, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we should have a, an applications note that will be published with a group um, that is uh, very successfully doing chip uh, from FFP samples, uh, even laser uh, microdissected sections of uh, FFP sections uh, carrying successful chip. And uh, we're also going to be soon introducing a kit uh, for FFPE uh, chip uh, fairly soon. Uh, we should be able to have that kit within the next quarter. Uh, so those are very good questions. I think uh, uh, if you have any further uh, uh, questions on chip from FFPE, please uh, get in touch with uh, Sean, and uh, he should be able to uh, uh, send you the material when it's available. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Um, the next question is from uh, Meng Ling, and it's, 
what's the ratio of total input protein and antibody use for IP? Um, so input protein, oh, I can't remember this exactly. Um, so I think usually uh, five micrograms um, is the is what I use. Depend again, depending on how much uh, of the target protein that you have um, in your sample, um, and the input protein I used was. Um, so 300 is enough to do an IP, but um, since I was using a polyclonal antibody, I decided to increase the protein amount, so I used 600 micrograms um, of protein with, um, I think it was, um, I don't remember the exact amount of antibody that I used, but it was, uh, I, can, I can send that to you via email later, the details. Okay, we're going to take um, one last question, and it is from Sam from the University of Delaware. Uh, for experimental 5-HMC treatment, how much of the double-strand DNA gets altered with 5-HMC, and then how does this alteration relate to 5-HMC found in vivo? That's a long question. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for the experimental treatment, um, it was only 30 base pairs. Um, in the middle of it was um, the binding site, and then only one 5 uh was at, well, one on each side of the double strand DNA was added. Um, and that was enough to influence, to decrease by almost half the binding of MAP3 to that probe. Um, and in terms of in vivo, um, as you can see on, uh, on page, here, let me go to that slide. Um, as you can see on the slide uh, right here. Um, so this slide has uh, the, the yellow is um, the binding site. So we included the 5-HMC that's, uh, that's, uh, that's size base pairs away from the binding site and, and extended that to 30 base pairs. Um, but however, in vivo, there's all these other sites around that could be modified. And it might be uh, it might be different, and um, the effects might be even stronger since um, since orphan 5 HMC usually has less effects than um, a cluster of 5 HMC. Okay, there is just one last question, and um, it's uh, from Joseph from Virginia Commonwealth University. Your question is: Is the ultra low chromatin method suitable for laser capture microdissection? microdissected samples, and the answer to your question is yes. If you have more questions, please reach out to us directly. We'd be happy to help you with that. And then, um, so I just want to thank you again, Cece, for this fantastic webinar. You did a truly fantastic job. And then do you have any final comments for the audience about uh, today's presentation? Uh, just uh, one last comment of um, this, like, I, uh, the interest, I, Sorry. Uh, um, this issue, this topic is really interesting, and 5-HMC is emerging since 2009, and it's a really great target to to study for mental illness, which is a big problem in our society. And so, if any you know potential graduate students who are interested in looking at a topic to study um, could continue this research, that would be great. Excellent. And also, uh, uh, Go ahead. Oh, and also, it, it, again, this took, uh, five, like, took two years to, um, and five different protocols, so um, don't give up when you think that it's going to not work. It might just, like, the, the one thing you need might just be around the corner. It's very good advice. And Hamid, do you have any final comments as well before we go? Uh, yes. Uh, I, chip, uh, chip is a difficult pro um application to optimize. Uh, so I think what we've done is we've, uh, we have come up with a very good and universal uh, solution for chip from tissues and uh, cultured cells uh, from mammalian t uh, tissues and cells that work quite well. So if anyone is having issues uh, and with chip and reproducibility or even apitope integrity, uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we would be very happy to help you. Thank you. Excellent. 
Yes, and before we go, I'd like to once again thank the audience for joining us today and for the interesting questions we received in the Q&A session. And any questions that we did not answer today um, that come in during the on-demand period will be addressed via email by the speaker. And if you have any specific product-related questions, as Hamid mentioned, about uh, it, any issues that you're having with your chip and other epigenetic-based workflows, please contact us directly, and you can reach me at my information, um, which was on the last slide. And before we go, um, Kavaris would like to thank LabRoots for making this webinar possible. Um, please know that this webinar will be available to be viewed on demand until actually November of 2018. And LabRoots will alert you via email when today's presentation is available for replay. We encourage you to share the email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event, and we hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you again so much to CC for the fantastic job that she did today. It was really a great presentation, and um, thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Yeah. Great, thank you.